I'm Hilary Hahn, and I am here with... I'm Alex Carr, uh, concertmaster of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. And we are in Hanover at the end of the tour. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. <laughs> Sunny, no. Oh, all. no. <laughs> <laughs> Winter. Snowy. Yeah. yeah. Even in March. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. But at least Hamburg was beautiful. It was. So we've been touring around. You guys did another concert that I didn't do. And mm -hmm. How is everything... As sort of a leader in a section, how does that hold up for you? I love doing it. I mean, I think I was made for this type of work. I love people. I love being around people. Um, I'm a Leo. <laughs> so that means I just love being around people. And I like being a leader. Um, but for me, I think it's, it's when you're a leader of an orchestra, it's what's most important, I think, is that you have to feel the, have the sensation and the mindset mm -hmm. that you're a liaison and you're a facilitator. And if you can get that mindset in your head, then it's the easiest way to become a, a leader of a group or a concertmaster. I think that's what I feel like. I feel like I'm there to help the conductor, mm -hmm. sort of as, as a liaison between the sections and him, but also between the sections themselves and each other. Mm -hmm. And I think and every movement that I make is, is geared to that. I, my movements are there so that anyone can watch, so that anyone can feel like, okay, this is where we're going to play. Mm -hmm. And so if I do that, then I feel like I've done my job. Mm -hmm. As opposed to like just mm. being soloistic about it? Well, I mean, because I don't you think have to give some cues and stuff. Yeah, I think, the, but the gestures themselves, I mean, are sort of exaggerations of natural mo like motions that you would like what you do. You play, you have natural motions that you make that you have with the music, whether it's the rhythm of, of a cue, of an upbeat, of a natural sort of a, of an impulse. Mm -hmm. It's just you take that and you just exaggerate it, and that motion is there so that everyone can see it, oh. and so everyone gets the feeling that because basically a conductor's beat can be interpreted in many ways, even though somebody's clear as yap. Somebody who has such a clear stick technique, it still can be interpreted by different people also in, through different distances. Mm -hmm. So if you can actually think of this motion, I'm translating conductor speak mm -hmm. into actually play speak. Mm -hmm. And in that way, a trumpet player who's very far back can tell exactly where my impulse is going to play so that right. he can time himself a lot easier. So there's no question of, oh, well, there's the, the, the distance right. that it has to travel, so that's where he's going to play and that's where my sound has to travel from. Probably also seeing two people working together visually exactly is helpful yeah instead of just watching one person you just kind of look towards there and you see sort of a reiteration in a different as right. saying, different language and the other thing is that everybody thinks that i would lead for my group but most of the group can't actually see me so basically what you what you you think of is i i lead for everybody who wants to who wants to and can watch and mm -hmm. at that point people move together behind me and then everyone moving as one gives the sensation of this is where we're going. But a lot of people in the very back can't see me at all. Because there are all these people in front between them and you. Yeah. Oh. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, we rely on each other. Mm -hmm. And sound, obviously. Hmm. So how did you come to concert master work? It's funny. It was by chance. I was sitting outside of Curtis and Richie Hawley, who's now... We went uh, to Curtis together. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Richie Hawley, who's now teaching at Rice, uh -huh. was walking by, and he was principal cornet in Charleston at the time. And he said, oh. he said, you know, we have this audition coming up. Where are you interested? And I was at the point in my life, I just didn't know what I wanted to do yet. Mm -hmm. And I thought, sure, why not? And so I went down and won the job. And, and it just sort of set me on this path. And I just, I, the first day I did it, I loved it so much. It was different than being in school when you do it you know, like, you for a job. You were Curtis. A little bit, yeah, yeah. For, a lot of, for a few projects a year yeah. or something like that. But it was, it's not the, <laughs> it <ain't> the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> but it was so much fun. I loved it. And so I thought... Yeah, maybe I really want to do this, mm -hmm. and so it just things opportunities just kept presenting themselves, and I was sort of ready for the opportunity when they came, and it was you know at first it was Charleston, then it was Cincinnati, then Amsterdam, and then uh -huh. you know I, I left to to teach at IU, and then now it's Dallas, so it's it's, it's sort of you know be ready for the opportunities when they come because if you can use them, then they're there for you. That's true. It's really the coincidences and being in that place, but you have to also be prepared. Yeah, because Richie called me two years later in Cincinnati when he had left for oh. to, to Cincinnati. <laughs> same exact thing, same coincidence. Oh, by the way, you want to have an audition in Cincinnati? So it, you know, He's it just your kept working. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, actually, concertmaster at school is different from concertmaster as a professional, but then also concertmaster in Europe means something different than concertmaster in the mm -hmm. states. You sit in the same chair, but it's mm -hmm. a different. Um, it's a different set vibe. of weeks or something as well, right? It's a shorter. Yeah. Well, you basically, share it? you share the job, which is great. Which is actually what I do with Nathan Olson here in, in Dallas, mm -hmm. or not here, but here <laughs> in Dallas. The proverbial here. <laughs> exactly. With the global here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I basically share the job with him, and it's more humane. I mean, being a concertmaster for a lot of weeks a year is tiring, 
and it's and it's sort of taxing on the the body and the spirit. And there's a point it's where you not, need a break. It's not just playing. No, it's it's dealing with a lot. I mean, fundraising. It's uh, I mean, it's doing all the bowings. It's dealing with with issues that arise within the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So all these things compounded, it sort of wears you down a bit. And I think when you have two concertmasters, I mean, four. They have four in Berlin. Wow. So I mean, I think it's more humane. It's it's easier on the system, and it also gives you the chance to go out and do projects. And it keeps your chops up that you know, going out and playing chamber music and going out and, and teaching, it gives you a chance to sort of have your career in different directions, which keeps it exciting. That, for me, is the best part, is that I get to do a lot of different things, and that keeps me fresh, which is important. When there are multiple concert masters, do they try to pick people who are compatible in style so that the... Hmm. The examples don't change every week. Like That's a you get really into good one question. bowing pattern with one person, and suddenly the next week with a different person. Maybe you played this in the orchestra before, but now all your bowings are different because. That's a really, really good question. <laughs> and in Amsterdam, the way we did that system was that the, my stand partner did all the bowings, and that we could change oh. them whenever we wanted to. Mm -hmm. But my stand partner would do them. In Dallas, he Nathan does his bowings, and I do mine for, mm -hmm. for whatever weeks that we're we're playing. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a really good question. I think that, you know, when in Amsterdam, like, I mean, the Boeings were Maulers. You so just I mean, explain you know, that Boeings, like, they're supposed to, the direction of the bow, and when you right. change, it's supposed to match up throughout the whole section. So exactly. someone has to make those decisions. Exactly. And whether it's on the string, whether it's off the string, a brush stroke, or a, or a really jumping high spiccato, I mean, you have to sort of establish for everybody what those parameters are. Right. But I think what ends up happening is that, yeah, maybe, th I mean, it's, I think subconsciously. I, don't, I wonder if people do that. That's a very good question, because I, I really don't have an answer. I would imagine that they do. Maybe the selecting committee listening to the audition has a similar set of things they're looking for in each person who Probably. might be getting the job. But well, I, I know when imagine. I listen for section audition, I, whenever I listen to the section auditions, I have, I have a certain sound that I'm going for, a certain uh, flexibility in the bow arm that I'm looking for, a certain type of vibrato that I'm looking for. So I'm, I'm not guessing that they would have the same criteria for the concertmaster. Mm -hmm. Are the auditions any different in Europe from how they are in the States? Yes. In how so? Fewer excerpts in Europe. I mean, especially in the German orchestras. In the German orchestras, you can basically play two concertos and you're done. In America, it's a series of rounds, and it's usually two concertos plus a lot of the, the basic solo excerpts. They don't do excerpts in Europe? In certain places, yeah. In Germany, a lot, they don't. In Berlin Philharmonic, we just have to play two concertos. Um, How about but the screen? Do they have a screen depends in on, It depends on the rounds. I think for section auditions, they always have until the finals. Um, it's so that master. the people watching don't, like, they don't see someone at first and get a certain impression, or they don't right. rec supposedly okay, recognize their colleagues, but I think right. they probably recognize someone's playing. Well, you know, what's interesting, though, here's a fairly funny thing, is that I've actually had students play in auditions, mm -hmm. and when you have 150 people who've applied that are playing for you, mm -hmm. after a while, the notes start swimming in your head, and you really can't tell anymore. Who is who? Yeah, you really can't. And it's you, and unless they do something, you know, because they're of, playing the same things. Yeah, they're playing the exact same things, and there's and maybe your student maybe didn't have the best day. They're still yeah. going to get to the finals or something, but they didn't have their best day, so it's, you, you don't really know. Not only some people try little tricks like like playing in like little cadences in Mozart concertos that oh, are really like obviously, like but the, actually that really makes me mad when people do that. I mean, I love I love if somebody does that in a concerto in for real in real life. Right. But in an audition, I think that's I mean it's very lame. It's, <laughs> it's a little too flashy. And also, it's, it almost gives the impression of they're trying to tell somebody on the committee who they are, which oh. I don't appreciate very much. Mm -hmm. In a concert, great. Do all the cadenzas you want. You see a fermata, cadenza away. <laughs> but, but I think that in an audition, you have to be a little bit more pragmatic. So what can make someone stand out in a positive way in an audition? I think, you know, everybody gets this impression that with auditions, like if you miss one note, that you're out. And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. I think that with auditions, you can never have a serial problem. There can't be anything that's, 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 that's sort of systemic in your playing. Any oh. issue like, first, one thing that I, I, mean, I, I like to listen to, first, first of all, for me, sound. Right. Somebody, the beauty of someone's sound, the, the vibrato, the fact that it's a blendable type of sound, mm -hmm. that's incredibly important. Obviously, playing in tune is important. Right. But I mean, it's not somebody who misses one note or two notes. It's somebody who plays in the cracks. That's not going to get through. You want somebody who has a good, decent sense of intonation. Mm -hmm. Then you want somebody who has a good sense of rhythm. Because as a colleague, even if it's, let's say, a student of mine gets a job in my orchestra, at that point, they cease to become my student, and they are now my colleague. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I can sit there and talk to my colleagues all the time and say, would you please play in the room for God's sake. <laughs> Remember you know? that thing in that lesson. <laughs> exactly. That doesn't happen anymore. And so you have that feeling of just, you know, you, there are certain things that you just, there are sort of basics that you need to have. Mm -hmm. And then there's musicianship. And somebody who has, who you can tell has an aesthetic. 
like a real, uh, like that you can tell what they think is beautiful. Hmm. That's for me is the bonus round. That's somebody who wins. The rest is people who make the finals. Mm -hmm. But for me, the person who wins is somebody who shows me their aesthetic. And I can see, wow, that person feels this is beautiful. And if, that, if they can convey that to me, then they're, it's a sure win. I think a lot of people feel like they have to hide their personality in auditions because they might not be neutral enough, so that's interesting to hear. And I think what happens far too often is that exact same thing. Mm -hmm. I think what, what's, what's, what's become of orchestras these days is they've become this sort of hypoallergenic sound. It's, just, it's, it's this sort of type of sound that's it's just sort of this. Mm -hmm. and, and orchestras have lost their identities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because they've been searching for people who can play notes and not people who have a certain type of, of identity within their, that sound, within that kind of a group. Mm -hmm. I always had the impression of, I'm just going to be myself. And if this orchestra likes me, that means I'll fit in. Right. If you're but, adapting yourself in an audition already, you can't. who knows if you're going to find the right fit. Exactly. Uh -huh. And for me, I, I don't try to adapt myself. I just, I am who I am, and if the orchestra likes me, great, and if they don't, they don't. And that's just the way it is. And I think that, that people quite often, it's it also the way the, the, or, the auditions are set up, because of the repertoire. Mm -hmm. there, it's so much repertoire these days. The lists are like yeah. entire symphonies. It's like a week's worth of music right. that you have to prepare, which is silly. What you, what, the, what you then get is somebody who can play a lot of notes, and who doesn't bring something to the table. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have somebody who can play a lot of notes. But when you then ask that person to be a musician, it's, that doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. You can't spontaneously get someone to play musically. It has, just because somebody can play in tune and just because somebody has a, a reasonable sound doesn't make them a musician. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that we've lost that a bit. And therefore, orchestras have lost their own identities and have become a homogenous type of, of, of existence. And I think that's dangerous. I think when that happens, it's, it, then you, you sort of it leads to sort of this sort of blasé classical music, and I think that's crazy. One thing I love about soloists is that, they're, especially right now, right now for me is like, the, it's a real heyday of soloists, because you have so many different types of people, like violinists, I love it. I, for me, I, I, whenever I, I, I get to hear all these different soloists, they have so much different personalities. This person I like about this, I like this person's sound, that person's virtuosity, this person's sense of rhythm. You know, it's, there's so many different aspects that I think, wow, that's cool. But then, if I get to hear the same violinist 15,000 times, why? Right. You know, at that point, it, you just, let's put anybody on stage. You know, yeah. put a synthesizer on stage and just right. press Korngold <laughs> or just press ba Brahms or Bach. You know, it, it's... it's it, that. Well, I do see, when I travel, I see some orchestras with, like, a really clear personality. Yeah. And for me, that is a challenge because, um, I mean, like, a positive challenge mm -hmm. that I have to step up to because we only have two rehearsals usually, and right. one of them is a working rehearsal, and the second is a playing rehearsal. And sometimes right. we may have another one for working. Right. But in that time, I have to adapt something. Like, everyone is adapting, and I'm adapting a lot mm -hmm. too, because sure. all those people on stage together have a personality together. Yep. And I'm just me, so it's right. just one of me. So it sometimes right. works best if I adapt something about my playing to match so it's a unified it's interpretation. Hard. It is hard, but it's what's rewarding. Yeah. Because if I'm just doing my thing all the time, it doesn't matter who's playing with me. How much then can you I separate pick up. at that point? Like how much can you deviate from the norm? Well my way only works if everything around it is supporting it. Otherwise right. I don't know what I'm doing. Right. It's like trying to speak your own language in a foreign country. And right. You just don't even know what you're saying anymore. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah. So it's just... I see your point. It's just weird. Like, it's really... I don't feel comfortable unless there's some aspect that's gelling. Right. And when I can find that really quickly... Right. Like, from one day to the next, then I know that that orchestra really has a character. Right. I think you're really clear about how you convey your, your what you want. I think... I mean, both... Well, there's certain both. things I want, but then the whole, like, conceptual structure mm -hmm. of it, I know kind of where I am in it. And right. I know details I like to do, but some of them might not work right. with this particular sound or this particular impulse. Like some orchestras just want to move forward, right. and some orchestras want to stretch out. Right. Others have like a kind of a um, like a really edgy sound, and mm -hmm. others are more refined and, and yeah. you know delicate. And I can't. I mean, I could, but I don't like just going in and playing exactly the same right. way with everyone. That's hard. So it's nice when I come across those orchestras. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I find it hard to 
to like I mean I we were talking earlier this that week about, about the solo gene and like <laughs> and to have that gene that that just lets you evolve into that maybe that's part of it for me maybe you know I, I'm really kind of a control freak <laughs> <laughs> like I hate flying because I'm not in control of the plane you know oh. it's like what the, give me the wheel give me the wheel there's a solution <laughs> except learn how to fly you your own wheel. <laughs> exactly but I mean I think that part of it is, uh, like that kind of ad ad adapting to every situation, that chameleonic type of thing, while still retaining your own identity as a musician, mm -hmm. that that's, can be scary for some people, I think. It is. I think it's... it's but it's like a roller coaster ride, too. But I, think you have to learn, I think you have to learn how to like riding roller coasters. <laughs> that's true. I think that's, I think that's the interesting point. I think but you, you have do to... something that we were talking about yesterday that a lot of people find much more challenging than what I was just, just describing, which is to step into a chamber group as a guest member for a mm -hmm. while. And often people say that it's, you know, like three against one if it's a quartet and you just have to kind of deal with it. Well, I've loved it. And one thing but I always loved about doing like to just Well, like, let's say I played chamber music with you. Yeah. If I were to play with you, let's say you, you were playing first, I'm playing second. Okay. So the first thing I would do is figure out what your, like, your, how your, your gestures, how you move. Mm -hmm. So I can figure out what your impulse is and where you're going to, and how your gestures uh, sort of convey what you play. Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to see what the components of your sound are. So basically what I want to do is I want to match you. And I'll still retain without, I mean, even if you try to imitate somebody, there will always be a part of yourself. You can't separate yourself completely. I don't right. care who you are. Right. And, and I always find that, like, it's funny. I was listening, like Debussy Sonata, perfect example. Uh -huh. I'm listening to a recording of Frank Pages. It can love be the, so different. And I love that recording. I really do. I, I, I love listening to it. I love his sound. I like the way he, his, his ideas of rhythm. I think, wow, like it's, I love that, those, those, the components of what he does. When I play it, completely different. Mm -hmm. Love it, I play it completely differently. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, even if you were, even if I were going to try to imitate it, it wouldn't work. So in chamber groups? In chamber groups, what I do then is that I'm trying to, to match your sound and match where you're going. And I view it almost like a game. Like, I view, like, how close can I stay to this girl? How much can I stay with her and still retain that right. part of myself? And then, basically, because the second violinist for me... Is, is, is sort of like, the, again, the facilitator. Mm -hmm. You have the primarius, and it goes through the second, and then all of these, these, these emotions and all of these gestures are being transferred across yep. like this. And so I view, I view myself like I have a function. Mm -hmm. And if I can be in that function and transmit these ideas while also transmitting something of myself to the audience, then I, I, I've done my job. And I love doing that. And it's funny, I've played with so many different violinists that have so many different sounds. Yes, and and so I. And it's so obvious when things aren't matching with string instruments. Yeah, but I love the, I love the game of matching. Uh -huh. I love that because at that point it's like I I learn and I learn something from it. I actually it's almost like when uh, like a it sort of imprints a part of them is imprinted upon you, right. and you learn something about their playing and therefore learn something new that you can do yourself. Right. Which is incredibly cool. So every violinist I've played with, I've I've also learned something from. Right. And even. So the good and the bad, something I have liked and something I haven't liked. Mm -hmm. So that's fun. And I actually, I enjoy the challenge of doing that. I think it's, it's some people, maybe some people it scares them, but I like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for me, it's, it's something that I just enjoy it. I think people forget that when you hear something you don't like, you can learn from that too. Sure. You don't have to just dismiss something because it's not catching your interest, you can say, well, what isn't catching my interest about it, and what would I do differently yeah. if I were playing it, and can I actually do that? Let me get to where I can do that. Yeah. Well, it's funny, when I was process. learning the Corn Gold Concerto, uh -huh. I purposely didn't listen to recordings for a long right. time, and especially not Heifetz. Because I was like, if I listen to Heifetz's recording, I'm going to imitate it. I know I'm going to imitate uh, and it, and it's going to kill me. You can't imitate anyone, really. Like, yeah. it never sounds right. If it you're always sounds like a bad imitating. copy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's like point one and minus, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's, it's never that great. Right. And I always thought to myself, like with that piece, what is it about Corn Gold I love? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I love the movie scores. I love, but I, I've played everything the guy ever wrote mm -hmm. for violin. Oh, yeah, because he All has the more chair music, as well. Tons of chair music, mm -hmm. tons of it. And what is it that I love about this guy? And then when I played, and for me, it was like, I just thought about a lot about the city where he was from and, and where he ended up and how these things sort of molded him. Right. And it was, and so I sort of took my cues from that and then found out where I could cheat by listening to recordings. <laughs> and you don't cheat, no. which is infuriating. <laughs> but um, There are but, no shortcuts at the end. <laughs> you know, there are a couple. <laughs> but it was, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah, again, the imitating, it, it, that, when you're trying to come up with your own interpretation, the imitating doesn't work. But if you're trying to, to support somebody in a chair music group, mm -hmm. it's fun. Yeah.
And uh, so I have a gazillion things I could ask you, but I need I should probably wrap it up because we have to go to rehearsal. Good <laughs> work. Yeah. Um, the final question I, I usually ask is, what do you like the most about working in music or playing? Wow. Or, like, is there something that when you think about the places you've been and the things you've done that sticks out as a constant thing that you look forward to? I learn something about myself every day. Mm-hmm. Every day, for good and for bad. And if, if I can use that as a means of introspection, I'm happy. I think that Why it's a that? challenge. Every day you go on stage in front of 2,000 people and you learn, if you can't learn something about yourself then, <laughs> when you're at your most vulnerable, uh-huh. when do you learn something about yourself? You can learn courage, you can learn cowardice, you can learn uh, tension, you can learn relaxation, there are, and love, death, <laughs> I mean, hatred, you know, I mean, all the coping, yeah. you know, it's, there's so many things you learn on stage, and for me, it's, it's a job that's always exciting, and for me also, I would have to say that I do not understand people that become jaded in music. Mm-hmm. I have loved every job I've ever been in, all of them, from every level all the way up. And I found challenges in every level. I found great people and colleagues in every level. Things that have inspired me at every level. Things that have made me upset at every level. And but that's fun. It's excitement. How many people go to their jobs and they hate them? They hate their jobs. And I think, how is that possible? Like, and and I actually, I mean, I, well, you know, my the, the people at IU, the, the the music students always call the normal students muggles. <laughs> like in Harry Potter. And so they, like, I always think of a life as a muggle. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, some people are very happy and some people, they go to their jobs to make money so that they can, mm-hmm. you know, subsist. And I think how lucky I am that I get to go and play. Play. Yeah. Because you don't, it's not working music. Mm-hmm. It's play music. That's true. I mean, it's like, in every language, it's always play. You know, you're true. Jouer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, feeling. yeah, mm-hmm. it's always play. So, I mean, if you think about that, it's, I get to play. Yeah. And make money, which yeah. is great. <laughs> and travel and see the world and meet right. really fun people. Right. Done. Done. All the way. I mean, for a long time. <laughs> but I mean, that's what better job is there? That's true. Thank you, Alex. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.